Hello and welcome back to our weekly Bible study. And let me start with a thank you. Many of you were praying that my travel would be safe, and it was, and that my three weeks in Cambodia, teaching at the Cambodia Bible Institute, would go well, and it did. God blessed the trip immensely, and I just pray that I was as much a blessing to them as the Christians in Cambodia were to me. It was just a wonderful, wonderful trip, and a privilege to be able to share Jesus in that class and to also watch those brothers and sisters in Christ and the churches there as they serve him so faithfully. It was just a wonderful, wonderful trip. So thank you very much for all those prayers. God answered them with a yes, with a yes. In fact, I asked specifically that the flights would be safe and boring and uneventful, and they were. <laughs> it's okay. 13 hours of boring on an airplane is boring, but a blessing, right? All right, now let's grab our Bibles and go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 14, and we'll get into our study for this week. All right, we are in Mark 14, starting in verse 12, and Mark has been working breathlessly to get us here. Story after story, quickly moving through the ministry of Jesus for those three years to get to what happens in these few days, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But to get to the death, the burial, and the resurrection, you first have to stop at the Passover. And Jesus says that he has eagerly been wanting to eat this Passover meal with his disciples because it is a Passover like no other. And we could get bogged down in the details of this because there are many. It is just thick with symbolism and rich with meaning. And John brings some of that out and Matthew and Luke bring some of that out. Paul will bring some of that out in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But Mark Mark doesn't spend a lot of time on it. Instead, Mark moves through these four quick scenes that have a beginning, a middle, and a future working toward an end that I think we need to look at. And they teach us not just about Jesus and what's going on at the cross, but they teach us about how we tackle some of the big important things in our own life. And I know that's setting pretty high expectations, but I don't have to meet them. Mark and Jesus have to, and Mark and Jesus do. So let's read the first part of this text, starting in verse 12 together. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, there prepared for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. All right, so the first scene that Mark takes us through is the preparation for the dinner. And he tells us this is all at the time of the Passover celebration and meal, that Passover being so rich with symbolism of God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt to what would eventually be the promised land and that promise of that land in Jerusalem and Judea fulfilled. It was slavery to freedom, oppression to freedom. And this meal, this meal that they're eating, not just the Passover meal of the past, but the Passover meal that would become the Lord's Supper, has the same meaning. It is a celebration of our movement from slavery to sin and death to freedom in life in Christ. And Mark wants us to see all of this, but he doesn't spend a lot of time explaining it. He just ties it all together and helps us understand kind of the big picture of it, that this is what's going on and that all of it is tied together. Now, one of the fascinating things that he does is he tells us about the room and he says, okay, it was time for the dinner and Jesus 
to, goes to his disciples and says, you know, it's time for you to set up. Seems like a really practical conversation, right? Who's going to get the paper plates? Who's going to get the cups? Who's going to get all this stuff? Like if you're preparing for a family reunion or a Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving, like is coming up very shortly. And so it's, you know, divvying up responsibilities, right? Oh, that's not all that's going on. Instead, he tells us about this interesting little exchange. I want you to go into Jerusalem and there will be a room that is prepared. And I want you to go and find a man who's going to be walking along and he's going to have a water jar. You think at first, okay, well, maybe Jesus has gone out of town and he's made arrangements or he's, you know, we would, nowadays we would, we would reserve the room there, the Airbnb with our app, right? Maybe he's made these kinds of arrangements first century style, except the details don't really line up with just he went into town and, and set this up. There's something else going on here. Mark is certain to give us itty bitty details that tell us something bigger is happening. That this man, that Jesus knows, for example, that this man is going to be carrying a water jar. Okay, if Jesus said there's gonna be a guy at the front desk waiting for you, well, anybody can arrange that. But when Jesus says, you're gonna see a guy with a water jar, go up to him and talk to him about the room. Something else is happening here. And what's happening is the provision and providential nature of Christ. God provides. Just like Abraham on the mountain when he had followed God's instructions dealing with Isaac and the sacrifice there, and God stops it because God never intended him to actually have to go through with that and instead provides a ram over in the thicket to be the sacrifice, we are seeing the same thing. Abraham then said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. And Jesus says, I want you to go into town. And it's just like this little small provision, but it's a provision nonetheless, and it's done by providence. You're gonna find a man. He's going to be carrying a jar, a jar of water. And you're gonna say this to him, and he's gonna say, well, yeah, I've got a room up there. And it's all going to fall into place as God's providence works. It's just a, a, a gentle reminder that Jesus is not just a man, but that Jesus is the Son of God, divine and providential. Now that's kind of important too, because we're dealing again with a meal that is going to be rich in Passover imagery. And through the Passover story, God is the provision. After they are delivered out of Egypt, you had the provision of manna every day so they had food to eat. After they complained about manna being boring, they have quail. And God provided that as well. And water from the rock when they were, uh, before all of that, uh, when they were thirsty. Over and over and over again, God had provided in big ways and small for every need they had. They, their sandals, for example, did not wear out throughout their wandering in the desert. These were things that, that seem sometimes just logistical, like with footwear. But if you've ever had a pair of sandals, you know 40 years is not normal. This is a providential miracle of God. And the same thing is happening here. And it's small, but it's real. And it's meant to just set the stage for God is in control. The things that we're about to go through understand God has it. And so in this first scene, he reminds them of the Passover meal and what has happened in the past and how God has provided. And then he shows them and God is still providing. And that's gonna be very important because of the scene that comes next. So now they are in the room and they are at the table and they have been celebrating that Passover and, and, and celebrating all of that imagery and the promise of God and, and setting the stage too for the fulfillment of the Passover promise that God would deliver God's people once and for all through the promised Messiah, who just happens to be sitting at the table with them. Let's read further. And when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and say to him, one after another, is it I? And he said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man 
by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. So into the middle of this rich supper, we have a very cryptic and dark moment. We've looked at what was, that God has delivered his people and he has continually delivered his people. That's part of the story of the Passover. God delivered and continues to deliver. But first, Jesus makes this unexpected stop into a scene of, but things are not all good. There is one here tonight, one who dips the bread with me, such an intimate action that is. Somebody who is not just eating and close to me, but so close, we share the same, in modern dinners, we share the same bowl of salsa at the table, okay? It's that sort of a thing. How close is that to you? Think about this. The next time you're at a Mexican restaurant and you're that close, maybe you're sharing a bowl of chips together, that intimate, that close. He says, one will betray me. And they know, betray him to his death. They look at each other and they say, well, who, 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 who is this? And he tells them, the one who dips his bread with me. And we know from other accounts uh, by, the, by the apostles that it was really pretty obvious. It really shouldn't have been much of a mystery, but their minds didn't go around to looking at everybody else and saying, who is it going to be? They all instead in shock go, well, not, not me. It's not me, is it Jesus? And they get worried about the whole thing, and it, it describes their mood as sad. So you have sadness and you have shock. And they've gone from a meal of celebration to now a moment of fear and sadness and uh, just ruined in a way. I, I think most of us at a dinner like this would, would you know, <laughs> we'd probably turn to the person next to and go, oh, that was a downer. You know, it just horrible. And they're wondering who this is going to be. And again, we know in the book of John that Jesus then says, this is John 13, I think around verse 26, 27, he then looks at Judas and says, what you do, do quickly. And Judas makes his exit and goes and makes his deal and sets up what is going to happen. Again, a reminder of God's providence, but also a reminder that God's providence is often having to work through a story also laced with the darkness of Satan's effort to undermine God's providence. Isn't that life? Life is full of times of remembrance of how God has done good. Life is full of times where we can look back and say, you know, God really brought me through some horrible and tough things, like the Exodus for them, and maybe for you, the Exodus from things you've been through in your life, things you've encountered. And you want to celebrate those things. Much of what we celebrate at Thanksgiving is not just great blessings that happen in good times. It is God has delivered me through times of hardship and hasn't it been good? I mean, that was the story of the first Thanksgiving, wasn't it? God has delivered us through some really difficult, horrible times. And this was no different. And it was a celebration. It was a story of hope. God has delivered, will continue to deliver, and will ultimately deliver. But there's always that little reminder and Satan's going to try and thwart it. He's going to do his. He's going to do his work, and there will be difficult times. And that's true for us. You know, we come together on Sunday, and we come to celebrate, and we come to eat at the table and celebrate this very meal, the the meaning of this very meal, and it is a mix of those things. And we know we don't like to think about it, but we know that there will be days ahead in our lives where Satan. It's going to try some things. We know this, right? It's why I asked you to pray for me on my trip, because I know anytime you're doing a good thing like that, anytime where there is so much potential in, uh, for example, the lives of those students, as the word uh, implants itself and grows in their hearts, you know that for me and for them, there are going to be some challenges and Satan's going to try some things, and he always does. And This time is, is no different. Mark lets us know that. 
and he tells us Jesus is about to go through the darkest night of his time in the flesh working for us, working for our redemption and working for our freedom. And that brings us to the next scene because the next scene is the why. Why do we bother you know, there are good times and there are things to celebrate, but why do we bother when we know Satan is going to continue his attack? Why do we bother when we know there will be people in our lives who try to undermine us? There will be people in our lives who are doing not the Lord's work, but Satan's work. That there will be times of hardship and sorrow and loss. So why bother? You know, there are a lot of answers to that. And, and you know, one of them for me is, Satan attacks you whether you trust the Lord or not. Satan attacks you whether or not you celebrate all the good things. Uh, I would rather, if Satan's going to attack, hold on to the celebrations. Hold on to the why of life. Hold on to the hope. Hold on to the future. Hold on to the eternity with Christ. Because if I'm going to have to go through mess anyway, I want to know that it has been worth it. And Jesus has that mindset in this night. Hebrews tells us in chapter 12 that it was because of the joy set before him that he endured what Judas is setting in motion as he leaves that room that night. Why did he go to the cross? Why did he go through all these things? Because it was worth it. Let me reword that. Because you are worth it. That's why. Why do we go ahead and tough through things? because it's worth it. And he gave us a reminder every week of how worth it for him it is and then how much it's worth for us. Let's continue our reading again. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. We know other accounts add the phrase given for you. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And this brings us to that third scene, Jesus institutes what we call the Lord's Supper, something we celebrate at our church every Sunday together as we remember what he has done. And he takes the bread, so rich in symbolism there in the Passover, the bread that was made unleavened because they didn't have time to let it rise. At the time of the Passover and the time of the Exodus, the idea was Make your bread, eat your meal, and get ready because God's about to move. And it's that same imagery here. Here is the bread. It is my body given for you. The time is now. We're going to eat this, and then we're going to get moving. That's exactly what happens this night. It sets in motion the events of the, of, of, of the cross and of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for our hope and our redemption and our salvation. He says, look at this bread. I want you to eat this bread. Whenever you eat it, I want you to think about this. This is my body. I give my body for you. So we do every week. We eat this bread. And it's not just the Lord's snack. It's not just a quick thing we do because it's tradition. We are back in this moment, in this scene with him. It is the why of his actions following the meal. It is the why of our actions day after day as his disciples. Because Jesus gave his life for you. Because Jesus, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, became sin on our behalf. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. He took on our burdens, took on our mistakes, took on our failings, and gave his body that we could be saved. It's an incredible sacrifice exemplified in this meal. That night and every Sunday as we celebrate it again, and then he takes the cup and he says, I want you to look at this cup. This cup is my blood 
of the covenant, my promise to you, your promises and commitments to me. This is our relationship, our covenant together. This is how much I pay. This is ultimately what he's saying. This is how much I pay, how much it costs. I give my blood so that we can have a relationship in eternity of hope, of joy, and of redemption. And then they sing a hymn. They've had a night that reminds them of all God has ever done. They have a night that foreshadows some very difficult times ahead. And they have this intimate moment where he tells them, and it's all worth it because it's for your salvation, your redemption. I will make this sacrifice. I am willing. Now let's go. It's time. There are many things in your life that are incredibly important. And you know that God is going to get you through them and you know that he's going to provide. He's going to send reminders like the man in the water jar that God provides. And through those times, you also need to remember these things. It is worth it. God considered you worth it. And God did not give his son to give his life for you for any other reason but that he loves you, wants to save you, and wants to bring you through whatever you're dealing with. And so we pray together. We celebrate the supper together. This is why we can gather together on Sunday to regain the strength and the focus because we know it's worth it. And God provides and God delivers. So what are we waiting for? Let's sing our hymn, get up and go because God has work to do through whatever it is that we will encounter in the coming days. God bless you and have a great week.